And as far as I remember, the same title as one of your books. And you have this book here. So if you are interested in this topic, please listen to Mary. But also, I encourage you to buy the book of the same title. Mary, for yours. Well, thank you. Yes, I am going to talk about death by regulation. Uh, but I don't want to discourage you. And I need to preface my remarks by saying I am going to talk about some pretty horrific things. But I want you to remember as you're hearing them, there is a silver lining, actually a very big silver lining. So uh, please bear with me and don't get too discouraged. So the first thing I want to do is find my PowerPoint <laughs> and see if I can actually change it. Yes, OK. So the first thing I want to talk about is in the 1980s, Stanley Gross decided he would do a study because he wanted to show how regulation protected people. And so what he did, he, went to, he was in the United States, so what he did is he compared the state regulations for different professions, and because each state had a little bit different requirement. And so he was very surprised by the results because <coughs> instead of finding that regulation protected people, he found just the opposite. In fact, in states, that had the most restrictive licensing requirements for dentists, optometrists, and electricians, he found that these regulations actually hurt people. For example, in states with the most rigorous licensing laws, for dentists, there was poor dental hygiene. With optometrists, when they were tightly regulated, there was more blindness. And in states that had more requirements for electricians, uh, there were more accidental electrocutions. So this was so shocking to him that he tried to find out why. And what he found out was that when you have more restrictions, there are fewer service providers. When there's fewer service providers, the prices go up. And when the prices go up, some people, especially the poor and disadvantaged, decide to do without the service. So their uh, dental health is worse, their blindness increases, and instead of calling out an electrician to help them when they have an electrical problem, they try to do it themselves or do without. So he was very shocked by this data, but as libertarians, we're not so surprised. And what he also found was that when certification was in place instead of regulation, that there were more service providers, there was more quality, and the prices were lower. And just for those who aren't acquainted with certification, basically what it is is a seal of approval by a professional organization or a consumer's organization. It's a recommendation, if you will, to consumers, much like we do on the internet today when we rate the different service providers, like maybe that restaurant we were to the other night. <laughs> so, when consumers rate the service providers, um, or when a professional organization gives their seal of approval, uh, people who aren't sure they know how to pick out a good service provider can either look on the internet or they can go to the professional societies and check out their seal of approval. And when that happens, there's more quality service delivered at a lower price. And I want you to remember that because later in this talk, I'm going to be recommending certification instead of pharmaceutical drug regulation. So we need, to, we need to talk about that. Now, tell you a little bit about myself. I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 19 years. I've also been an expert witness against the FDA. I have done legal briefs for nutraceutical companies. So I have a big, broad spectrum of experience in this area. And you'll see it come out in my talk. I just wanted to let you know I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> I do have some experience. Um, and what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk about the regulations in the United States uh, for the part of the Food and Drug Administration that regulates pharmaceuticals. Now, I'm talking about it in the United States because it's been so well studied that I can present very good data to you. But this isn't just about the United States, because every country in the world has some type of drug regulation. And things that I'm going to talk about 
in the United States apply to other countries as well. In fact, about 50% of new drug research is done in the United States, so what happens to pharmaceutical research in the United States ripples outward into the world. So when I talk about all the Americans that have died from this regulation, recognize that it's happening in your country too. And there's an international movement, which I'll talk about at the end, to harmonize all these regulations, which you should read as make them just like the FDA that I'm going to tell you about today. So this influences us all. So let's start with what happened in 1962. In the United States, uh, Kefauver Harris amendments were passed. And as you can see from the list here, it really gave the FDA unlimited power over the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it, it dictated, the FDA could dictate what animal studies needed to be done before we could do human testing. It um, dictated what human studies were needed for safety and effectiveness. It also dictates what you can say in ads or labeling. According to the FDA, commercial speech, which it believes ads and labeling are, are not protected by the First Amendment of our Constitution. So there's no free speech in advertising and labeling, at least according to the FDA. Um, it also oversees manufacturing. It can basically put a company out of business by saying their manufacturing line isn't good enough and by not good enough. It means that the people on that line and supervising it have to have a certain level of education. They can dictate that. Um, also, maybe the biggest thing is prior to the passage of these amendments, drug companies used to give all of their data to the FDA. And if the FDA didn't object in six months, <coughs> the manufacturer could market the product. But now, after the passage of these amendments, somebody at the FDA has to sign on the dotted line, I think this approval is a good idea. That means if a drug has a side effect, and every drug does, and the Congress gets wind of it, and they want to beat up on the FDA, they have a person to put, <laughs> to put on the hot, hot spot. Right. So this was a very big difference. Now, you might think, well, well, 1962, okay, so all these changes are in place? No. This was open-ended. These regulations grow every year. They're metastasizing throughout the system. So when I talk to you about what's happening, realize it's, it's still happening. It's still happening and increasing. And, okay, this is the really bad news. These regulations, as I'm going to show, have cost each of us at least five years of our lives. That's a conservative estimate. I actually think it's closer to 10, but based on the published studies that I'm going to show you, I can only calculate five years. But there's a whole big segment that I'll talk about at the end that I can't estimate, and that's probably even bigger than the five years that I can calculate. I did tell you I was gonna tell you bad news first, <laughs> but don't get too discouraged. Okay. So what happened in the U.S. is that these amendments, uh, of course, empowered the FDA. They reshaped the pharmaceutical industry totally, redefined medical practice, and shifted our medical paradigm from <coughs> prevention to treatment. How did this happen? And this is valuable information for you to know about how regulations work. You've heard some from many of the people here at the meeting, but here's what happened in the pharmaceutical industry. From 1949 to 1961, you can see with these uh, blue uh, bars that it took about four years to get a drug from the lab bench to the marketplace. After the amendments were passed, you can see in the pale green that the timeline increased until it came to 14 years. In other words, about a decade was added to the time that it takes a new drug, a life-saving drug, to get from the lab bench to the marketplace. Now, when we were working in the AIDS epidemic, the AIDS patients knew they didn't have that extra 10 years to wait. So what they did is they not only got drugs from Europe, where, which didn't at the time didn't have these horrible regulations, uh, but they also took the drugs that we were working on in the pharmaceutical firms, hired black market chemists to make them, and by the time the FDA actually gave us permission to test our drugs in people, every AIDS patient in the U.S. had already taken them, if they wanted them, and was, were resistant. So we had to wait until new patients were diagnosed before we could do the FDA-mandated studies. 
And the cancer patients decided they didn't want to go to the black market. They actually sued the FDA for the right, if they were terminally ill, to take the drug of their choice. And the courts ruled that Americans have no constitutional right to save their own lives with unapproved drugs. So, uh, yeah, pretty bad, huh? So you might imagine that a lot of people died waiting when this extra 10 years was added to the development time, and you'd be right. Uh, I'm going to show you, you, you don't really need to look at the, the math here. I'm just showing it for those who are into this thing. We know how many new drugs we have every decade. We know pretty much, or at least we have estimates, I should say, of how many lives each drug saves. So you can actually calculate the total number of lives lost by adding this extra time from the amendments. And the number is 15 million American lives. This is huge. And you might imagine that with this extra decade of time, there would be additional cost to development. And of course, you'd be right. Now, what I'd like to point out is that the research and development cost for an NCE, this is a new chemical entity, which is a way of saying a new drug, not just a, a knockoff, a new drug, um, was increasing a little bit at a time before the amendments were passed. And if you extrapolate out, you might get something like this. Once the amendments were passed, the cost of getting a drug to market grew exponentially and it's still growing. This is an old data point because that's the last one we have. This is a median drug approval time at 2008. So we've had a whole decade to come up even higher. And you might imagine, because you're all libertarians and therefore know a lot about the economy and the economists, you might imagine that this would increase the price of drugs if the cost of getting it to market was increased, and you'd be right. Because what happens is the average cost of a prescription drug in the U.S. pharmacies is directly related to the capitalized research and development cost for each new drug. And this is the pre-amendment point here. And as you see, there's a very good correlation between what we pay at the pharmacy in the U.S. and our development costs. For the technically inclined, the R squared is 0 0.94, which is about as good as it gets in real life. Now, this means that we've increased the prices of our drugs in the US seven to eight times, roughly. And remember, this point is 2008, so it's probably much higher. Um, another way of looking at that is just to say that if the pre-amendment trends had continued, we'd be paying about 16% of what we do at the pharmacy today. This is a huge, huge difference. But I'm only getting started. <laughs> and I told you it was going to be bad news at first, right? <laughs> okay, the biggest problem in my, well, actually not the biggest problem, the second biggest problem, <laughs> the biggest one I can't estimate accurately, but the the second biggest problem is the loss of innovation. Okay, so it doesn't matter how much money you have. If a new drug hasn't been invented yet, if it hasn't been discovered, you can't buy it. And so loss of innovation is a very big deal. And studies show that at least half of our new drugs drop out in mid to late development. In other words, as they get to the, towards the end of that 14-year cycle, they drop out for economic reasons. What that means is the manufacturer has figured out, hey, I'm not going to recover my development costs. I'm going to lose money on this drug, so I'm not going to continue to develop it, even though it might save lives. Because if I don't make a profit, I go bankrupt. So, and, and there's many drugs that drop out before they even start development. I actually got a call from the FDA when I was working on prostaglandins and liver disease. Prostaglandins are a natural hormone that every cell in our body makes. If you're taking fish oil, you're taking it so that you make what we call the good prostaglandins, or eicosanoids, as they're called today. So, the FDA calls me up and said, Dr. Ruart, we're very excited. We understand you filed a a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease. The reason we're excited is there's nothing for this type of liver disease. 
uh, you know, 100,000 people die every year. We tell them to have bed rest, and that's the best we can do. So we're here to help you get this drug to market. And being young and naive at the time, I believe them. <laughs> but the problem is, this process is so institutionalized, the FDA can't just wave its magic wand, or at least usually feels it can't just wave its magic wand and say, okay, let's put this drug on the market. And when you have a really new drug, what happens is you don't know how much you need to give. You don't know how many times a day you need to give it. You don't know how long you need to treat the patient. With something like liver disease, it takes years to develop. It might take years for you to treat it. And the scary thing is if you guess wrong on any of those numbers and you start doing your effectiveness studies, which generally take years, then what happens is you you might not get the statistical significance that the FDA requires. And if you don't get that, you have to start the study all over again. So what management figured out is that if we had to repeat our studies, if we guessed wrong the first time, by the time our drug made it to the marketplace, it would be a generic drug, and we would never recover our cost of development. So they decided not to even try, even with the FDA's support. And many drugs, are sitting today on the shelves of pharmaceutical companies that are, could be life-saving but will never be developed and will never get to the marketplace because the manufacturer realizes as costs go up exponentially, they're not going to be able to recover them. And that happens more and more and more each year. Now, if I make very conservative assumptions and I say that these lost drugs are only 25% as effective as the ones we have now, and I assume we only lose 50% of them, not the 75 to 80%, which is probably the real number. That's another 26.7 million Americans who have died since the passage of the amendments to 2010. So adding a few more little things on this, what you see is that about half of the Americans who have died since 1962 have lost about a decade or maybe close to 11 years of their lives. <clears throat> Another way of looking at that is each of us have lost about five years. <coughs> and, you know, we might be willing to put up with this higher cost and this longer timeline if it gave us more safety or more effectiveness. But as far as we can tell, it doesn't. Yeah, so, it, for example, you know, some drugs are put on the market and then it's found that they have lots of side effects. And so they're withdrawn from the market. And before the amendments, the withdrawal rate was about 2.5%, which actually isn't too bad when you think about how difficult it is to predict these things. Uh, after the amendments, it was about 3.3%. So it certainly didn't go down. I don't know that these numbers are different, but they certainly didn't go in the right direction, the, the direction promised by the amendments. Also, the biggest drug disasters pre- and post-amendment were thalidomide pre-amendment and Vioxx post-amendment. Now, thalidomide actually never came to the U.S. It was never approved in the U.S. because they had questions about um, peripheral, what we call peripheral nerve damage. And what actually happened with thalidomide is it was approved in Europe. It was a safer sleeping drug than barbiturates. But the side effect that it had was that if you took it when you were pregnant in the first month or two, your baby might be born with missing limbs. And women started taking this, pregnant women started taking it because they also found it took care of morning sickness. So, of course, back then we didn't appreciate that the unborn baby is much, much more sensitive to drugs than the mother is. So, in Europe, there were about, I think, um, 10,000 babies born with these deformities. Some died. And in the U.S., we had, I think, a half dozen because the drug was still in testing. So this really never came to the U.S., though it might really never came to the U.S., but these 1962 amendments were supposedly passed to prevent them. And as I'll tell you in a minute, they actually created the American thalidomide incident, which I'll talk about in a minute. So they did just the opposite of what they were supposed to do. Now, in the meantime, in the 90s, Vioxx was approved. And by the FDA's own estimates, which are low, I suspect, um, there were 140,000 heart attacks caused by this drug and 60,000 deaths. So it's very difficult to argue that we don't get 
uh, uh, um, you know, unsafe drugs don't come to the market after the amendments. And actually, there's been studies that in the U.S. showing that it's now the fifth leading cause of death. Properly prescribed drugs are the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. Why is that? Well, today, no manufacturer will develop a drug without a patent. And the reason is it's impossible to recover their costs. Now, I'm not a big believer in patents, and the studies I've seen show that only highly regulated industries actually have their innovation helped by patents. And when I started at the Upjohn Company, we still developed drugs without patents. But about a couple years before, a couple years after that, uh, management told us we would not do that anymore. If a drug didn't have a patent, we wouldn't develop it because they had figured out we wouldn't recover their costs. So not only are patents questionable, I have several of them, <laughs> so I can tell you the process is a little bit of gamemanship. And so it's, and it's very difficult to tell, you know, what, um, it's very difficult to tell where one idea stops and another begins, as you might imagine. And we can get into that in the Q&A if you want. But um, So anyhow, also, because it costs so much to get a drug to market, manufacturers don't like to do drugs, don't like to put drugs in the market where, where you take them for a short term. They want you to take them for a lifetime, <laughs> because otherwise they won't recover their costs. And, you know, your body's a very great thing if you take a foreign substance, a patented substance, which most foreign substances uh, are. Uh, if you take a patented drug, for a short time your body is pretty clever, it can handle. But if you take it for a lifetime, you start really depleting a lot of nutrients and other factors that you need to detoxify it safely. And of course today we prescribe multiple drugs. Some seniors are taking a couple dozen drugs. You keep adding more drugs to the equation and eventually the body can't handle it. So I think that's I don't think today's drugs are actually less safe. It's the way we, uh, the way we choose to develop them. It is the way we choose to take them. And you know, this is all due to the amendments because before the amendments, you know, short-term drugs were the norm. So, why hasn't the safety improved with all of these new studies? Well, <laughs> we just don't know any better. Uh, you know, science is. It's not, uh, it's not as good as we would like to believe sometimes. We can't predict everything. So eventually drugs will get to the market that do things we don't predict. And no matter how many studies you do, it's unlikely you'll pick up on these. So that's why the same safety issues that we had before the amendments, which was too little scientific knowledge, are the same ones that we have today. And that's why the amendments didn't improve safety. Uh, they didn't improve effectiveness either, as far as we can tell. That's a little more complex story. I'm not going to tell it today. But what I want to tell you is the other big problem that these amendments have. And that is its impact on prevention. So, you know, I was working in the industry back in the days before we had genetic manipulation. So we couldn't just play with the genes and get a sick animal. And you know our Upjohn rats, they were so healthy. We had titrated every vitamin and mineral and you know their exercise conditions, everything. They were so healthy. How were we going to find a new drug when we didn't have a disease model? So, aha, what we did is we started taking away their vitamins. We started taking away their minerals. And then they got sick. In fact, they got diseases very similar to what you see in the American public. So, of course, for us researchers, the light bulb went off. Optimal nutrition is very important. But, <laughs> you know, that's just part of the story because, you see, remember we talked earlier about how the FDA doesn't think commercial speech is protected by the First Amendment? Well, one of the things about that means that you can't make claims for vitamins and minerals. You can't make health claims in the United States easily for vitamins and minerals. So, I was on the plane one day, I was talking to a gentleman, he said, hey, I hear your company is developing these Lazaroids that just do just about everything, and I really could use something like that, can you 
help me out. Now, for those of you who don't recognize the word Lazaroid, it comes from the word Lazarus, who was the um, individual that the biblical Christ rose from the dead. And they were named that because they did so much. But when I talked to the project manager, who was the one in charge of these Lazaroids, he said, no, we can't give this guy any Lazaroids. But tell him to take vitamin E. It will do the same thing. <laughs> so why are we spending all this money developing the Lazaroids if vitamin E will do the same thing? Well, because if we wanted to make the health claim that vitamin E did this, that, and the other thing, we would have to take it through the 14 years of regulatory uh, red tape. And of course, since it's not patented anymore, we wouldn't ever recover our development costs. So we can't do that. And it's really sad because, you know, vitamins can really protect you against side effects of other drugs. For example, coenzyme Q, which came from Japan, it was a prescription drug there, and a couple of libertarians who founded the Life Extension Foundation brought it into the U.S. And it was, they were telling people how wonderful it was. And so the FDA came after them for making health claims for an unapproved drug. And the attorneys for these two libertarians said, hey, you better settle with the FDA and figure on doing some prison time. No one wins against the FDA. Well, these libertarians said, hell with that. And they started going on the radio and television and talking about coenzyme Q and how wonderful it was. And you know, the legal process in the US is very slow. So it took about six years for all these charges to come into court. And by that time, uh, most of the doctors in the American public were on board with coenzyme Q, and uh, instead of being convicted, <laughs> they were acquitted. <laughs> so, so the FDA doesn't come after them much anymore. And you know, it's a good thing because coenzyme Q is what your doctor will recommend you taking. It's, it's a, something your body makes on a regular basis. If you take statins, statins are one of the most widely prescribed drugs in the US and most of the Western world but it causes muscle weakness, and this can be prevented at least partially by coenzyme Q. So it's very important that these things are out in the market and available to us, and I think if Life Extension Foundation had lost their suit, we might not ever have had CoQ, CoQ10 in the United States. And I don't know how, I don't know if it's available in different European countries, but it's a very important nutrient, and there are many like that. Um, you know, I told you earlier that the FDA actually created the American thalidomide. And it did because of this ban it has on making health claims for nutrients. So we knew in the early 1980s that one of the B vitamins, folic acid, could prevent birth defects in babies. These neural tube defects were very severe birth defects. Most of the children had to be institutionalized or they died. And women had to take folic acid in the first month or two of pregnancy when they might not even know they're pregnant in order to prevent the birth defects. So of course the folic acid manufacturers, when they found out about this, and they found out folic acid could prevent almost 100% of these birth defects, wanted to tell the American public about it. But the FDA told them they'd be prosecuted if they did that. Even when the Center of Disease Control in the early 90s, another government agency was telling young women to take folic acid, the folic acid manufacturers were told by the FDA that if they took folic acid, I mean, if they advertised this, this CDC recommendation, they would be prosecuted. And so it wasn't until, and then the FDA did this big reversal and demanded that all the grain manufacturers put folic acid in their foods. Well, of course, you don't get the right dose necessarily when you do that. So probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 American children, 10 to 25,000, depending on whose numbers you use, were, were born with these birth defects. And many more were aborted because we test for these birth defects in utero. So I call that the American thalidomide. Just as tragic as it was in Europe, maybe more so, because it could have been easily prevented. And then another thing is that some Natural products are so potent that a couple companies have tried to make drugs out of them. So in the case of fish oil, for example, two companies decided they would add a little extra chemical group onto the active ingredient of fish oil. When you took it orally, your body would take that chemical group off and you would have fish oil. 
So it took it through that long, involved process. And my sister actually qualifies for prescription fish oil. And what she found out is she could buy high quality fish oil over the counter from her pharmacy. I mean, from, you know, or, or like Walmart or something. <laughs> Um, and pay the same amount as her copay would be with her insurance. Uh, and, and so, of course, she just started, she just kept taking the over the counter fish oil. There was no financial benefit for her to take the prescription fish oil. Now, a little aside, the prescription fish oil, like all fish oils, have some toxic chemicals in called PCBs. But there are a couple manufacturers, Life Extension, I believe, is one of them and Barry Sears, who have uh, fish oil that's purer than the prescription fish oil. But it is against the law for them to go to doctors and tell them that because they haven't gone through the 14 years of regulatory <laughs> hoop jumping. And, um, oh, also, you know, um, stem cell research is being driven offshore in the United States because the FDA says if you take stem cells out of a person and put them back the same day, that's okay, that's medical practice. But if you take them out of the person's body, grow them up in a test tube for a week, and then put the, you know, many more stem cells back in, which will work much better, that's a drug, and it has to go through the long process. So that's, that's pretty much been driven offshore. And then there's some studies that suggest that we might all extend our years by a couple, our lives by a couple years, if we took the proper amount of vitamin D. But of course, Vitamin D manufacturers can't really talk about that. <laughs> so I think these things probably are just as bad as everything else I've talked about so far. I think this probably has taken another five years off our lives. I can't prove it. I don't have the studies to show it. In the other cases, you know, you can actually make the calculation. I can't with this, but you can easily see how that could be, that we would actually lose 10 years of our lives to these regulations. So, uh, my conclusion is that the side effects of regulation can be just as deadly <laughs> than as side effects from pharmaceutical drugs. Now, I did tell you there was a silver lining, and that is because it doesn't matter who we are. Regulators lose these five to ten years of their lives. <laughs> Congress loses these five to ten years of their lives. <laughs> 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 Yeah, uh, the president loses five to ten years of his or hopefully her life at some point. Um, our elected officials lose their lives. Um, and so my belief is that this is an area where we actually could be effective in changing the paradigm. Now, not all people who are affected are going to believe this, but I think enough people, even people in power, uh, might recognize that this is a problem and want to change it for their own personal benefit. And this is, I think, the big silver lining. In fact, if you think about it, health care is the big issue right now, at least in the U.S. and probably in other countries too. And I think we could make a very big case that this is something, you know, that we could change because it affects everyone. Uh, the recommendation I make in my book, Death by Regulation, is of course repeal the amendments, but since so much of it has ended up in case law in the United States, which means the courts have decided that these little facets of the amendments are good things and they agree with them, uh, I think you need to take away the approval power of the FDA and make it a certifying agency. Of course, I'd rather get rid of it all together. But in my book, I just argue that the 62 amendments are really bad medicine. And so my recommendation has to be made on that. And this way, you see, if a person says, I don't believe all this data, I want to make sure the FDA has approved what I take, they can do it, right? They can wait till the FDA says it's a good drug. But those who don't want to abide by that won't have to. So everyone will have freedom of choice. And again, I just want to mention that this thing is, uh, I, I said this was worldwide, they're trying to harmonize, they do it through the codex. I'm not going to go into this very much. I do want to say, if you want to learn more about codex, go to the National Health Federation website, because they actually have a seat at the codex council, council and so they know what goes on there. Otherwise, it's kind of a closed shop. And actually, my understanding is that Germany for a while 
um, actually had to abide by some of the codex rules. They're trying to make vitamins by prescription only if they're over a certain potency. This is what, what was in Germany. My understanding is they backed off this. And I would love it if any of you know what's happening in your country, according, you know, if they're requiring prescriptions for low amount of vitamins, you know, like vitamin C. I take, I take about 2,000 milligrams a day, not 200. So, you know, this would be, be terrible from my point of view. If you know what your country's doing here, please let me know, because it's not, it's not obvious. And finally, I just want to let you know, uh, if you want to know more about this, my book, Death by Regulation, just came out in April. It has much of what I've talked about today, obviously a little more information. And my other two books are also here. I have limited copies. If I run out, um, see me and we'll, we'll arrange something. Uh, I, I'm going to stop now, so if I have time for questions, uh, you can ask me. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Mary, isn't the, didn't our friends at the Goldwater Institute succeed in getting a right to try yes. legislation passed yes. in H1? Right to try was inspired by the cancer lawsuit that I told you about. And basically it says terminally ill patients can negotiate directly with drug companies to get drugs for themselves. <laughs> the problem is the FDA can punish drug companies that do that by dragging their feet on their approvals. So I think right to try, even though it's a great idea, is going to have limited, limited play, shall we say, in the U.S. Now, there is another initiative coming. <laughs> Free to Choose Medicine from the Heartland Institute. When a drug enters the Free to Choose Medicine track, it never has to stay in the FDA's good graces anymore. It's essentially out there in the free market. So uh, if you see that coming down the pike, that's something to consider supporting. And uh, I think that could actually establish something similar to what I'm suggesting. In fact, my hope is that my more extreme recommendations will support people in thinking that free to choose medicine is conservative and go for it. <laughs> uh, yes, Dr. Lark. Yes, um, I understand why you use the title death by regulation, but allow me to suggest something at least in terms of your presentation. Mm -hmm. One of the unfortunate things that has happened is that people more and more assume that regulation means government regulation. Mm -hmm. There are all manner of regulation. You can have extremely strong regulation purely through contract. Mm -hmm. uh, regulatory institutions, for example, in the financial markets, you can have, there's all manner of regulation that's done by stock exchanges. Yes. So I think, it's, if I may suggest, it's useful to make sure people understand that regulation and government regulation are not the same thing. Yes, and in the book I do that a little better. I talk about competition as being the best regulator, but time time was limited, <laughs> and this audience understands that. Yes. Uh, will the slides be available for us to see after the conferences? Uh, if you'd like them, just email me, Mary at ruart.com, or you can go to my website, ruart.com, and email me from there, and I can send them to you. We are going to try to post everything, and hopefully most of the slides will be in there. But if you want them directly, just contact me. Yes. Um, Mary, defenders of the FDA would say that it was created really to protect people from snake oil salesmen. In fact, the early uh, employees of the FDA used to test these things on themselves uh, in order to, to see whether or not the claims were actually um, uh, valid. So how do you respond to those who would say, well, if we get rid of all this, then we're back to the era of snake oil salesmen Wild claims will be put on labels and consumers will have no idea, no, no redress or recourse. Well, two things. That's why I'm talking about the 1962 amendments. You notice I didn't talk about all the regulation before that. <laughs> and the regulation before that pretty much, pretty much took care of that. But the other, other answer is that actually the snake oil salesman had something good. If it turns out that if you compare fish oil which is similar to snake oil. <laughs> rattlesnake, <laughs> rattlesnake oil is, is probably what we have in the US. Uh, not only is um, snake oil very effective, but if you compare them head to head, the, and, and you do this by making rats swim till they're so exhausted they give up, what happens is the rats getting snake oil do better. 
So <laughs> this business about snake oil well, salesmen. You get, my, you get my point. I do get your point. There's yes. A lot of crazy uh, being claims, you know, today yes. about um, sure. organics and all sure. kinds of and other things. And it's really <laughs> the organic producers today are actually making a premium profit out of things being organic. When That's in right. fact they are they are no better for you than uh, an apple. I, that, I, that, I, that, I, right. That's one of the reasons. That's one of. It's I, I was just saying I would disagree with the claim that organic foods aren't more, aren't better for you than, than non-organic foods. But that's the beauty of the free market. You buy the non-organic, I buy the organic, and we pay our money and take our chances. Right? That's right. And and the other thing is, organizations like Life Extension Foundation, for example, are, you know, having third parties test their products. You see, this is this isn't happening today with drugs. Third parties don't test their products. The drug companies test their products, and they send the data to the FDA. Third-party testing would be much more effective, and that's what Life Extension does with its um, product line. It makes sure that everything that they say is in there is in there. They also review all the studies that have been done on different drugs and different nutrients, and then, of course, you as the consumer can decide. And so I recommend that, lef.org or lifeextensionfoundation.com. Check them out uh, if you need information. And I think probably my time's up. Okay, so thank you very much.